learn more about the livery, do uh, head over to farmerslivery.org and have a look. Uh, a couple of housekeeping points tonight, if I may. Uh, it makes for better viewing if you watch this in full screen mode and uh, you can't be seen by the panel, but you can feed questions and comments via the Q&A button uh, at the bottom right of your screens. Uh, the main questions have been selected from the ones uh, that have been submitted already and some of those have been conflated and I shall be looking at the Q&A feed as we go through and uh, we'll try and fit some of those in as we go along. So to our panel this evening, <clears throat> this is in alphabetical order, not order of precedence or importance. Uh, firstly, we have Helen Browning, who is Chief Executive of the Soil Association, very well known throughout the industry and has held posts as Director of External Affairs of the National Trust, Food Ethics Council, she's a trustee of the RSPB and on the Countryside Commission. She sits on the BBC's Rural Affairs Advisory Committee and the National Food Strategy Advisory Panel. Helen farms quite famously in North Wiltshire organically and supplies branded products to large and small retailers and indeed through her own mini hotel on the farm. So welcome to Helen. Next, we have Dr. Tamsin Cooper, who is the director of the National Food Strategy. This is the initiative being led by Henry Dimbleby, um, looking radically at all aspects of our industry, the food industry. Henry, of course, is the son of veteran Question Time presenter David Dimbleby, which is a nice little congruence tonight. Tamsin has held a number of roles in DEFRA, including leading the EU exit oversight team. That can't have been very easy and in the strategy unit. Uh, before joining the government in 2018, she was um, director of the Green Alliance and head of agriculture and land management at the Institute for European Environmental Policy. She's been a, a member of the natural, uh, well, NERC, as you all know it, advisory committee and currently board member of Grantham Institutes, uh, whose mission is to contribute world-class research and innovation on climate change. Next, we have George Dunn. Uh, George became chief executive of the Tenant Farmers Association. George, you need to turn your camera on. If you haven't, I can't see it, but you probably have. Um, and he did that in, started there in January 1997, having worked at the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, at the C Country Landowners Association, and we're well known to a lot of you. He's represented the TFA on the Tenancy Reform Industry Group since its formation and he's a National Trust Specialist Volunteer on land use and governance issues. Our final panelist is Christine Tacon, who is a liveryman of this company, actually, uh, since 2008. I looked her up, especially in our white book. She's the chair of Red Tractor. Very good luck with that, Christine. Uh, I've written the industry leading food assurance organization. Uh, that's what it's badged as. She was the first groceries code adjudicator and I can speak personally um, from having experienced some of her adjudications that she certainly achieved a significantly greater fairness for suppliers to the UK's largest supermarkets. She's chair of MDS, a graduate recruitment and training uh, business and chair of the BBC Rural Affairs Committee. That's uh, an important position. Uh, Christine's a chartered engineer and a lot of us know her from when she ran, ran the cooperative groups, extensive farming businesses for some 11 years. She is uh, a director of the AF group, a farmer cooperative, and uh, importantly, I think, founder of Women in Food and Farming, a network to help women in the industry develop their skills and their confidence. I think you'll all agree we have an outstanding panel to listen to and learn from tonight. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and by no means least, the chairman of the proceedings tonight, our own dim will be for an evening, the illustrious master of the Worshipful Company of Farmers, Richard Whitlock. Richard is the doyen of uh, all grain traders and well known for his involvement in many farming trade associations in the Oxford Conference and the East of England Agricultural Society. Um, I'm going to hand over to Richard now and I'll see you all at the end for a few wrapping up comments. Over to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Jeremy. And uh, so we've done the introductions, ladies and gentlemen, so I'll go straight into the first question, if I may, which is, what role does environmentally sustainable farming have to play in developing better food, diets and health? And that question is from Mike Adams. 
Now, Tamsin, you're on the National Food Strategy, and probably this is one of your key focus points. So can I ask you to open with your response, please? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And it's a huge pleasure to be here with you this evening. So, I mean, that is all the question that's um, preoccupying our thoughts on the National Food Strategy. So I want to start by giving a bit of context on the relationship between diet and health, and then think about how environmentally sustainable farming can help improve that. So our diet is making us sick. Um, we're eating more and more of our calories from rich, energy dense food, 50% in fat. And if you look at consumption of fruit and vegetables, for example, um, very few of us are eating our five a day. In children, that's about 18% of children who are eating that many fruit and vegetables. So in terms of our diet, there's quite a long way to go towards a sort of healthy and sustainable diet. And this is having consequences for us as well as for the NHS and us and our communities. And that's manifest in type two diabetes and heart disease. We've got stroke and colon cancer. And there's an alarming statistic that one in 10 people who are over 40 suffer from type two diabetes, which is entirely preventable. So we've got a sort of situation of preventable disease and premature death that is associated with diet. And these effects are population wide. So um, we see them across the population, but some are very strongly income correlated, particularly on fruit and veg. Now, what are we going to do about it? That's a complex response. It's going to require government intervention, but also fundamentally, it's going to require changing the culture and value around food. So to get to the answer to the question, that's, that's the context. You can't value food if you don't know how it's made. And so one of the important things is to bring production and consumption together. We have to understand consumers and citizens have to understand the provenance of their food and how it is produced. And through the course of the National Food Strategy, we've seen some fantastic initiatives by um, LEAF in terms of Open Farm Sundays, FaceTime Farmers. We've engaged with charities which are bringing children onto the farm to start that conversation about food, how it is made and the sort of values that are associated around it. I should say that education in and of itself is not enough, but this, this bringing together how food is produced and how it's consumed is a really fundamental part of the question. The second piece is that clearly um, to improve diets, we need to eat, going to eat more fruit and veg. And so there's a big opportunity here in terms of boosting domestic horticultural production in the UK. And I've seen, I was at a strawberry farm yesterday that were trying sort of innovative me um, methods um, and strawberry production. I've been, had the pleasure of visiting Helen's farm where she's shown me the sort of agro forestry methods where you Tamsin, I'm, I'm going to interrupt there because yeah. I want to get around the rest of the panels. You've done a very good job in setting the scene. So thanks very much indeed for that. Can I ask Helen, please, to respond to your situation? Because obviously your type of sustainable farming is slightly different. How do we get farming to influence food diets and health? Well, it's interesting. The Soil Association was formed you know, in 1946 on the premise that we needed to understand the relationship uh, between the health of soils, plants, animals, and ultimately people. And we need to crack all those problems together. You know, today we're facing a climate challenge, a uh, nature challenge, a nature the biodiversity crash, and a human health challenge. And I think that if we don't uh, address this from the ground up in terms of uh, ensuring that the way we farm uh, is naturally healthy, because if we don't have a healthy environment, none of us are going to be healthy in the longer term. And then we're producing fantastic, nutritionally dense foods that people will thrive on. And as Tamsin said, the, one of the big challenges is that we're eating so much ultra processed food and not enough real food that's coming direct and, and, and straight from the farm. 
So there's a huge amount we can do in this in this area, but we have to crack those problems together. It has to be about sustainable, environmentally sustainable and healthy diets um, uh, if we're going to uh, make those links. And there's still a lot of work to do to explore that relationship between the health of the way we farm and ultimately the health of ourselves. But I'm convinced as a farmer who's been farming organically for the last 35 years, I see it in my animals all the time, actually, if you feed them well, they live well, you have far fewer problems. Do you think farming then has got a sales story that it's not fulfilling at the moment? Well, I think it's got, it, maybe it's got a sales story because actually in some areas, there's lots of farmers doing brilliant things, but in some places we actually do need quite dramatic reform as to the way we're farming. Um, because we are still too dependent on agrochemicals, we're not necessarily looking after our soils in the way they need to be to start that cycle of health. So yeah, we, we, we can get the sales pitch right, but first we've got to get the farming right. So George, are all of your farmers who are not farming organically not doing the job properly? Richard, absolutely not. No, I mean, we, we, have, we have members who farm organically, we have members who farm according to leaf standards, we have members who farm uh, commercially. What I think is really important, and I think we would probably all agree as panelists, is that we need to see this as a system and not as an either or. Uh, so when you've got a farm, it's, it, it is involved in food production, it's involved in environmental management, it's involved in biodiversity uh, restoration, it's involved in recreation access, animal welfare, uh, producing energy, byproducts. And the problem that we have is we so often deal with these issues in silos rather than seeing them as a complete whole system where all of those things need to be balanced. And at the end of the day, Richard, farmers don't produce bad products. Milk, meat, grains, fruit and vegetables are all great. It's what happens to them after they leave the farm is, is, the, is the main problem. And what can be more sustainable than taking grass that we can't eat and turning it into protein that we can. So uh, I, I think there's much to be celebrated about our agricultural uh, industry but we must see it as a system, not in individual silos. But some of it was also a uh, shopper or um, restaurant uh, uh, choice as well. Um, nobody tells you what you have to eat or put in your trolley. So there is something that is wrong with what the consumer is doing as well. And that has to be some of the message. Christine, um, you've moved more towards the um, uh, away from closer to the retail end, back towards slightly towards the farm production end. So you've probably got a good loop into that dilemma that we face. How do you see the future for environmentally sustainable farming influencing food, diet and health? Well, I, I was interested to see the little video that Henry Dimbleby did recently. I think it was a TED talk where he basically said, we're all hardwired to eat the wrong things and we cannot put the responsibility to get that right at the door of the farmer. We're hardwired to eat the wrong things. So there's got to be a mass level of influence from retailers, from government, from food service, from everybody to try and guide us in the right direction. And, uh, and I think that the, the education side that Tamsin talked about was, in, was, was, was useful and that will be helpful as well. But we've also got to recognise that there's no point showing everybody about how you do things in the UK if actually we're importing food that isn't produced in that way and to those standards. And that's where, and that's really what excited me about the red tractor rule. That as uh, can, I, can I come on to that? Can I, we've got one of those lined up later. Yeah. So if we can okay. stick to this bit at the moment. So I thought it was. Between what the consumer's <laughs> eating and what yes. farmers are producing, how do we influence their diet and their health? Well, I think that that was part of the same thing that we're trying to we're all trying to influence them in different ways. We cannot put that responsibility at the door of the farmer, but the farmer can do some things towards that influencing. OK, thank you, George. Thank you, Richard. I, I, I think we just need to, to to bear in mind that I don't think consumers are acting necessarily in a way which is uh, intrinsically bad for themselves. If a lot of surveys that are carried out with consumers suggest that they want to buy local, they want to buy nutritious, they want to buy uh, stuff which is, which is good for them. And, and obviously when they are presented in retail stores with stuff, uh, it's not that they're being duplicitous, it's just that they're not being presented in the right way with the stuff that they really do want to, to, to buy. So I think there's a major responsibility upon retailers, upon food service, to ensure that they are delivering the nutritious local uh, foods that people truly do wish to consume. But when they're presented 
in a in a retail store or a food service either with a quick decision on a purchase, it's very difficult for them. That leads us on to a, a good point. Can I just move on to the next question? Because I think these do flow quite well then. Does the panel agree the polarization of different food and farming systems, such as organic versus intensive or vegan diets, do a disservice to those farmers trying to utilize the best science to achieve that critical balance of regenerative farming, environmental management, and healthy eating? And that question is from David Lord, David Hutchinson, and Grant Burton. So having a similar question from three different people who put them in, I think this is getting to number, the number one of the issues and takes it to a new level. Helen, are we using organic as the champion of the brand at the expense of everybody else's activities? I, I agree with the thrust of the question that it's really unhelpful to set different farming systems against each other and to be sort of talking about these things in ways that are come sometimes quite polarizing. And I think the language coming through of regenerative and agroecology is more helpful actually than just saying, you know, if you're not in this particular camp, then you're not doing stuff right. I, I agree with a lot of what George was saying about actually there's a huge spectrum of farmers all doing uh, exceptionally good things, um, and but some that still need to Im improve. So I do think that, 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 that it's going to be important to try and make sure there's a really good pathway to more sustainable farming that everybody feels they can get involved with, that they can measure and, and understand their progress and where they can still improve, that they're given the right incentives and help to improve, because we actually do have quite a short window of time to make sure that farming is really a part of the solution for climate and nature and human health and not as it's currently seen and in some cases actually is part of the problem so uh yeah let's not, let not let's not stay in our camps let's make sure we have a big tent here but let's not lose the urgency um uh to move towards ever better farming systems um so we're all farmers together then helen we are all farmers together and we've all got lots to learn from each other um, there's lots of new opportunities coming through, lots of new technologies that can potentially help us. Um, but we do need to be standing together, learning from each other, not endlessly criticizing each other. And I know that's, you know, something that, that, that there has to be a bit of challenge in the mix at some point. But, uh, but I do think that, that we all need to be really in earnest about the role we have to play in shifting into a much more sustainable direction. And that's all of us, you know, I, uh, none of us are perfect now. We, I, as an organic farmer myself, I still have a huge amount that I need to deliver and improve on over the next 10 years if we're really going to meet the, 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 the climate challenge. So is the Soil Association's new mantra, we're all farmers together, or are some farmers more equal than others? No, very much so. So we're, we, you know, we're, we've very much set out our stall that this is the 10 years where we need to transition to agroecological farming and, uh, and trying to find mechanisms that will help all farmers uh, really shift in that direction. I think organic is something to be really proud of. I think it's a really clear standard. Uh, the consumer really understands it. It's growing really fast uh, worldwide and in the UK. So that's, uh, that's an important brand, I think, for farming to have. But it's not enough just to have even 10 or 20% of the world being organic and the rest of the world not really moving enough as we all know we need to. Uh, so I think our role is to help all farmers shift in that direction and to get the diet stuff right as well. It's okay. controversial at times, but it's really important we sort the diet stuff. Christine? I think that in any other industry, they would laugh at us actually not just all stealing the best ideas from each other um, and thinking that you've got to be in, on what, in, in one silo way of working or another. So we have to take the best of everything. And I think when, as a non-farmer running the co-op farms, I was shocked when we took over an organic farm to discover that none of the managers in the business had ever been taught anything about organic farming when they were at university. And I think we need to make sure that people are educated about all of the different types of farming and all of the things that you can learn. And they were shocked. They were honestly shocked at some of the things that they were trying that worked because they hadn't, they hadn't learned about them. But that's not just about, are oh, they taught the right things at university? It's all about continual professional development and keeping on learning and finding out and looking at what other people are doing and learning from them. And we should all be looking at getting the best of everything. Thank you. Tamsin. Thanks. 
So I'm not going to add controversy to this because, I mean, I agree, the holy grail um, is that we need to find, you know, a series of production methods and dietary choices that deliver food, environment and nature and against our carbon goals. It's that, you know, that, that trinity of goals that the whole system needs to adjust towards delivering. And there's not one single you know single route through there's not a single pathway and you know the, what we've learned about the resilience of a food system is the inherent diversity within it and that what that looks like in a whole set of different pathways is sort of social innovation driving um sort of new new techniques and production practices and collaborations between farmers it involves agroforestry and agroecology it involves regeneration of our soils and it involves sustainable intensification, sort of highly productive farms. And, you know, we can see advances in technology that's facilitating some of that and these social innovations. So I think the, the future is plural, both on the production side as well as on the diet side. And I don't think either on the diet side we're sort of specifying a sort of single dietary solution because that clearly doesn't work. There are cultural and social influences on diets and that diversity. Thank, Thank you. George, quick answer, any comment? Because I've got the next question that's lined up for you. Yeah, very, very quickly, Richard. I think, I think the worst thing that can happen is that we have some sort of internecine struggle between different types of, 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 of agriculture. And if people want to eat organic, if people want to eat vegan, at the end of the day, they're all our customers and we need to be supplying them with the best products that we can. And I think if we're all honest, there's probably as much difference in each sector in terms of standards than there is between each sector. So we all need to up our game, whatever way we're, we're doing our farming. But I think, as you said earlier, we're all farmers together, Richard. Jolly good, thank you. Now, this is a question I certainly don't have any ideas on the answer, George, so I'm gonna put it to you, but to give all of the others notice, because this to me is a toughie. Um, would carbon accounting and carbon tax be an efficient mechanism to allow society to pay for its environmental footprint? How do we achieve an accurate system of soil carbon measurement to enable a financial incentive for land managers to maximize carbon storage? That's from Sebastian Anstruther, Fred Morton and Mike Gooding. And obviously, uh, George, in the uh, Queen's speech, we were talking about environmental impact. We've got the sustainable farming incentive at the moment. So these are tough things and um, uh, giving out credits and that sort of thing, is it going to change behavior? How do we really make a difference? Okay, Richard, well, thank you for building that one to me first. Um, uh, what I would say is we are within the agricultural industry at the very beginning of understanding how all of this plays out within our industry. And there are many discussions in webinars and forums where this is being debated. At the moment, there are a number of, of carbon calculators, but there is a major difference in how they operate and they produce different answers, which currently isn't helpful. But hopefully, as we, as we hone those and we use them more and we learn more about those calculators, we'll get to something which is rather more consistent across the, across the piece. And obviously, farms have got a lot to offer in terms of the carbon story. So in the soil, in the grassland, in terms of the photosynthesis, in the, in the hedgerows, in the trees, uh, uh, and, and there is a, there's an awful lot that farmers can, can contribute. Um, but within the tenanted sector particularly, there are some big questions that need to be answered. So you might have a, a tenanted holding where the landlord has reserved the trees out of the agreement. So uh, who, who has the responsibility for uh, monetizing the carbon that the trees might be taking in or, or, or letting out? There's a question that we're debating. You may have a, an agreement which is for five years, well, what about the soil that the landlord has provided for the generations before you took the tenancy? How does that play through? Um, so I, I, think, I think there is an emerging and a quickly emerging uh, uh, degree of, of understanding about these issues, but there's a long way to go before this market becomes as mature as it needs to be to contribute to, uh, to, to, to what's going on. But the final thing I would say, Richard, is our industry doesn't want to be scapegoated. Remember, the UK agriculture is responsible for only 10% of our national emissions of carbon. Um, and what we don't want to see is a massive program of tree planting right across our agricultural land 
and then we simply offshore our carbon problems by importing stuff from abroad, where we know 25% of carbon emissions globally are from agriculture. So we need to be very careful about how we play this through. Uh, Tams in my brain certainly isn't big enough to cope. I, I can recognize all of the problems, but I'm struggling to see where the solutions are and giving people fines, giving them subsidies, giving them incentives is all very well. But what we want is real outcomes. How are we going to deliver on those? Yeah. So, I mean, shifting behaviours on diet is is a tricky thing. And embedded in that question was a question about carbon taxes. And I think, you know, they're theoretically possible. And there are some, you know, there are some strong advocates of carbon taxes in the economist Dieter Helm, for example. But I think our conclusion is at the moment that it's not easy to do. There are problems as George says, in terms of measurement, you have to have a mechanism at the border. You have to ensure that they're non-regressive and they're not impacting. So I'm looking for some answers. Yeah, I, I, yeah we all know the problems, um, you know, and I'm struggling with the answers. That's the dilemma. So, so in terms of changing behaviour on meat particularly, so you can stimulate meat alternatives. That's one of the answers. So that we substitute... Um, um, consumption behaviours with meat alternatives. You've got mechanisms like procurement, which changes the norms around what we're eating. And there's all sorts of work that are going on with the supermarkets in terms of the ways in which you can reformulate products. So there's routes to changing behaviours, which doesn't require sort of the lever of a carbon tax, as the question suggests. Christine, give me some answers. I need some inspired thinking. Carbon is exciting, and I think that focusing on carbon is sort of shorthand for doing something that is probably right. There's an awful lot of other things that need to be taken into account as well. Um, I'm an advisor to a, a tech company that has taken the best of all of the existing carbon calculators, and they've developed one that actually works, and they've been... <laughs> it around various people at the moment to show how it works but that is just a small part of a whole sustainability package that they've that they've put together but everybody just wants to talk about the carbon bit uh, the retailers are focusing on carbon and uh, and the, the george was right that the global systems that exist already don't mm. take into account hedges and trees so we need to make sure that we have a carbon system that takes into account how we farm but the technology is is there that we will be able to start measuring it we will be able to start trading it and farmers will get paid for sequestering carbon it's a shorthand for where we're trying to get to but it's not doing the wrong thing if you're focusing on carbon but of course what worry about wildlife and bugs and all those other sorts of things as well but carbon is something that's getting retailers excited about it's something that can be monetized and uh, we, we, we don't need to understand it. We just need to be given the tools that are calculating it for us. Uh, Helen, has British Farming got a message to send to say something like COP26 this November? Well, I think it's vital that we do start to internalise the externalities of farming and food so that you do end up with a logical economic incentive to do the right thing and disincentive to do the wrong thing. You know, we live in a world where money counts and actually if you want to get behavior change shifted, you've got to get the financial frameworks right. And I think that's the question behind the idea of a carbon tax and also the public money for public goods. How do we incentivize farmers to do the right thing through paying them for carbon, but also for biodiversity or for you know, nutritious food or for, for access to farms? We've got to get those that framework right so that it's really much easier for farmers to make the decisions to be doing things that are going to benefit climate. I think there are still some questions around how much you tax and how much you incentivize. Um, and I think there are some thorny questions around soils um, because we know that if we can get soils to sequester more carbon, it has huge benefits, uh, both for resilience to the climate change, but also to mitigate against climate change too. And uh, there are some challenges around the methodologies. Um, there are some international standards like Vera now, which are uh, well thought of, are seen to be the gold standard. Um, and I think it's going to be important for us to cluster around what methodologies are we going to use to measure soil carbon. And there's nervous about permanence um, in terms of soil, because unlike a tree, which is likely to stay there for 100 years or 50 years or whatever, 
farmers can come through and plow those soils again and uh, and release the carbon again so we need to actually work out if we're going to get carbon credits for the on the basis of carbon sequestration in soils how are we going to make sure that that's going to stay there and not be released in in a few years time but there's massive potential more potential in soil probably than there is in above ground biomass in trees and 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 and, and shrubs it can take up to 20 or 30 years for a tree to do much in terms of total positive outcomes on carbon, whereas soils can start to sequester fast. So we do need a soil carbon code. We do need to start to really use soil as a way of moving us forward. And overall, we need to get that the economics of farming right so that uh, we penalize the bad stuff and reward the good stuff. Um, that's a big you know, how we do that is a very big question. You haven't got time for me to say. Christine, then George quickly. Christine. I've already said my bit. You've done your bit? Right, straight up to George then. Uh, Richard, I just wanted to push back a little bit about what Tamsin had to say about finding meat alternatives. I don't think that's a solution at all because uh, we need to remember that the methane cycle is much shorter than the carbon cycle. Yeah. Uh, we need to understand that we are re recycling carbon in livestock. We're not mining carbon when, when, we're, when we're eating eating meat. It's, it's more about better meat, not less meat. And the first thing we can do for better meat is buy local. Um, so for me, I mean, I agree that I think there are multiple solutions. And I think better meat is part of the solution. But if we are to meet our carbon targets, it will involve, there is a consumption element in that. And I think, you know, one of those pathways is to substitute some meat with alternative proteins. But alternative proteins could use as much, if not more carbon than meat. Well, you're doing a very good job because you're giving me more chances to lead into the next question. So you're a very insightful panel. Um, Tamsin, I'll put this one to you. How much of the current red meat industry will survive the projected success of plant proteins as meat substitutes? And that is from Derek Kelly, a meat producer. Thanks. I mean, so I don't think it's an either or. It's like it going back to the question we had before. I don't, you know, there are there are trends in meat consumption, and alternative proteins is not clearly not going to replace um, all forms of meat production at all. We need meat as part, livestock as part of the system, but there are, but um, I think do think alternative proteins is part of. A solution alongside decarbonizing the um, decarbonizing our livestock, whether that's through methane suppression or other routes. And I think there's a whole different set of approaches. It's not an either or. Um, I've just had a question which relates to this. Then um, is government just responding to lobbyists? George, you get involved in some of the negotiations. Uh, yeah, Richard, I, I think I think the, the the problem that we have here is inappropriate government policy based on inadequate evidence and inadequate science. And I think there's a risk here that we demonize and criminalize livestock production unnecessarily because we don't yet properly understand the carbon cycle that takes place on those farms. Uh, and, and actually, my view is we probably need to eat more meat to save the planet, not less meat. Uh, but as I say, it's got to be better meat, and local meat is the solution to that. So I, I, I fear that um, inappropriate knee-jerk reaction in terms of government policy, particularly taxation and regulation, could lead to problems for the livestock industry. But what I would call for is a better evidence base, a better understanding before we see these types of populist uh, um, and lobby-based, as you say, uh, 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 policies being implemented. Helen, you're a livestock farmer. Are you producing vegan sausages at the moment? No, I'm not. Um, but I do think we need to be uh, realistic and uh, about the role that livestock, if we continue to eat meat at the level we are eating it globally, we yeah. can transition to a sustainable future. 
Um, and uh, there's a very big difference between the kind of systems George is talking about, where you're feeding uh, ruminants on grassland as part of a rotation, um, uh, compared to feeding loads and loads of grain to feed lotted cattle. You know, uh, something like 60% of our grain, which could be feeding humans, is being fed to livestock. Livestock should be more on leftovers and pastures that are biodiverse and supporting a healthy environment. Uh, we can't go on down a road where we're eating as much meat as the Americans do coming out of feedlots and intensive uh, farming systems when we know there's a massive downside in terms of pollution, antimicrobial resistance, even the pandemic risk that's coming out of those kind of systems. So, of course, livestock, I love farming livestock um, and I like eating meat, uh, but I think we need to be doing it in a way which is supportive of that overall need to get the balance right, that does mean it's less, uh, and probably much less in some cases, uh, but better. There are some places around the world where people need to eat more meat because they are nutritionally compromised. So I think there it, it, it is about the how we do it, and it is about trying to find ways of using waste um, to feed our pigs and poultry, for instance, rather than feeding them loads and loads of grain that could be feeding us directly. And ruminant livestock, I think, does have a role, but it has a role out in the fields supporting the biodiversity that we, we all want to see, not in American feedlots. Um, we have a continual um, call from farmers. Well, if you paid us more money or paid us a good price, paid us a premium, we would be able to deliver better product. And yet the consumer and the uh, retailer is always pushing for lower prices. And that, Christine, I'm going to take you straight into the next question, actually, because this leads well into this. Is the present red tractor standard fit for the future? And should we label imports produced to different standards? That's from Tony Alston and Nigel Barnes. And I'd like to include in that, of course, the uh, discussion in the Queen's speech where they talked about animal welfare and sentient beings. Well, that, that's why we have to review the red tractor standards on a regular basis to make sure that they are um, fit for the future. And uh, we have to make sure we have to get the right position between the tension of what consumers are asking for and what farmers can practically and affordably deliver and to try and end up with red tractor standard being absolutely on the right point of that. And uh, there's no way that, that the standards that will come out later this year will be fit for the next five years, but they will be right for the next year, maybe two years, maybe three years. So we need to keep, as, as consumers keep putting more and more pressure on us, they need to keep evolving. But as we improve our standards to, to produce the way consumers want us to, we need to educate people that that is what British food is. And that's why it's so important to keep that red tractor logo in front of consumers so that they will know that if they really care about these things that that that, uh, that they'll know how to find them but i just want to go back to every other industry i've worked in you always are under pressure to be do jobs more efficiently and better and for the same price or even less and that's where you've just got to keep innovating looking at different ways of doing things and it will get to the point where everybody's just saying no we can't do that you're going to have to give us something to make us do it and that's when you get government retailers and consumers responding. What are we going to do about labelling imports produced to different standards? They need to be very well. They will. They will be labelled that they are that they are imports. We just need to make sure that people recognise that if you care about the environment, then and you want the, a quick way of actually checking that it's been raised to the standards that we have in the UK, you may as well just buy British. But there's a big argument going on at the moment between, say, Australia and uh, the UK on a free trade agreement and um, they want access in the same way that New Zealand lamb comes into this country, this sort of thing. So these issues are going to hit farming in terms of this open doors policy that the government seems to want to run with and that's going to hurt British farmers isn't it? Uh, we just have to make sure that, well yes it will, but we have to make sure that we're explaining what the red tractor stands for, what British farming stands for and expose what their farming stands for and be, a, be aware that they might be farming it better than us. So we need to be right on top of and leading edge in what we do. Some of the poorest supporters of British food, uh, British produced food, have been government procurement agencies for hospitals, prisons, the armed forces and those sort of things. Is Red Tractor influencing those sorts of players? 
The answer is, I don't know. I'd like to be, and I will certainly be ready to, to support. I'm sure that's going to be one of the things that comes out of what uh, Henry Dimm will be saying, because the, one, the, the, biggest, the main part of the population that needs to eat outstanding, nutritious food are those that are sick. But produced to our standards, are we, are we putting up barriers to trade? Uh, Tamsin. Yeah, I mean, the review does cover the procurement issue. We were invited as part of the obesity strategy to look at it. So the report in July will, will talk about procurement. Um, I want to just go back to the point about evidence and the debate around meat, because I think as Helen set out, it's a very nuanced debate. And I think, you know, the, one of the things that we will do in the review is to set out some of the arguments. We've been absolutely robust in our evidence base. So I think to, to, to characterise it as it's, you know, sort of a spurious um, set of arguments, we, we, we do, it's, it's a challenging issue on me and the evidence base is really important. And, and of course, we all have to, we have to pay close attention to what the evidence is saying. Helen? I think, like. I think on the issue of um, imports, I think the public is going to be outraged if we import uh, products that do not meet UK standards. Yeah. And if we go down the route, uh, you know, I am absolutely uh, delighted at the way uh, standards are continuing to evolve in the UK. And I do think the Red Tractor has has continued to do that, needs to do more. But, you know, actually, we're on the right path. But it, it is crucial that we do not undermine uh, farmers and even if we label it's all we're all promoting to the consumer this product will end up in food service in public procurement when there's no label uh, or in processed foods where again it's really hard it's really easy to disguise uh, the product so I think we need to be really clear I agree with Christine that sometimes other countries produce things as well or better than we do uh, I'm not saying we're always perfect but if you want to ratchet up standards in the UK, which I want to, we must make sure we're not undermining uh, producers through our trade deals. Just a quickie around all of you then. Do you mean you won't import food, that uh, Britain won't import food produced to lower welfare standards, lower food safety, lower health, uh, without, uh, with, without being sprayed with pesticides that would be illegal to produce here? Where are the parameters that you set for all of these, George? Richard, I think it is um, both disingenuous and duplicitous to be setting any standard on domestic production across any of those frameworks that you just talked about and allowing imported product into our country, which is produced below those standards. It's simply unforgivable and a million people signed a petition last year to say that they wanted that to be something that was outlawed so we must absolutely hold the government's feet to the fire on its commitment to say that it will not allow imports into this country which are produced below the standards which would be illegal to use here but red tractor has got some work to do uh, richard and, uh, and it's great that christine uh, is, is on the call and this you know the things that red tractor can do which, in, which includes looking at how farmers are properly rewarded for the ratcheting up of standards that Red Tractor is, is constantly uh, bringing, uh, bringing to the fore. Because at the moment, producers don't feel that they're adequately rewarded for the enhanced standards that they're being asked to adhere to. The extent to which consumers identify with Red Tractor, and we've seen a bit more of that just recently for some of the advert campaigns, but consumers are still very confused as to what Red Tractor uh, is all about. And the extent to which Red Tractor is auditing supply chains, we know that grains get mingled between those which are Red Tractor assured and those which aren't. Um, how does that bring value to, to, to the consumer? Um, and where is the Red Tractor on market development, both at home and abroad, in terms of the standards that we are, uh, we are champ championing? And, and lastly, I think uh, there needs to be uh, a greater degree of governance and accountability back to the farming community for Red Tractor. It operates too much like a government department that tells you you have to stop doing something rather than working collegially with the farming community. And we'd like to see a little bit more of that, uh, uh, that accountability. So sorry, Christine, a bit of a list for you, but uh, uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, avoid the uh, opportunity. But every decent farmer in this country must be shocked and horrified that some of the uh, newspapers that have reported uh, dreadful animal welfare practice, and it's also on YouTube, and that's in the UK. Christine, have we got to do more 
than just um, temporarily ban them from being livestock producers? Have they got to be had? Have you got to have a license to produce um, food, and then it is taken away for you from you never to come back in? How can we stop some of these bad apples that we have in the UK? Uh, well, red tractor, I suppose, I think that's partly what what George is just arguing that red tractor does actually become a bit of a license because. Yep actually audit every single farm every year with the exception of livestock which is every 18 months so we see both seasons it is a far more rigorous inspection regime than we ever had with the rural payment agency and if we find people that are non-conforming that we can actually by, by by taking the red track to mark off them they then are not allowed they're not able to supply a chunk of their supply chain and uh, well that that's that's not true is it actually because a cow's only got to be red tractor assured for the last six months of its life. A sheep has only got to be assured for the last three months. And what happens before that doesn't have an on-farm accreditation system. Yeah, what, 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 what I just said is that if, if we find that somebody's non-conformance, we will take the red tractor away from no, But they're not, they're not being audited. You're talking, about, you're talking there about whole life assurance and that uh, they, they have... I mean, Red Tractor tried to push through whole life assurance, and that was in 2016. And the pushback from the farming community was absolutely massive. Uh, why, why, why did, why, if we want to say we are the best in the world, if we want to say we don't want imports brought in to lower standards, surely we should push our standards up and say whole of life, the whole of a sentient animal's life should be accredited and audited. Then you can wave the flag and say, Red Tractor is a credible audit scheme, surely. Yeah. It, it is a credible scheme, and but there, are, there are standards that we, that, that there are many ways in which we would like the standards to be higher, where the consumer wants the standards to be higher and the retailer wants the standards to be higher. But those all come at a cost, and who's going to pay for that? And that's what happened with the whole life assurance debate, that there was such a pushback from it that the retailers realised the pool of people that were going to be able to provide whole life assured meat would actually force prices to go up into the shops. So we then, it's all about the affordability. It's a, it's a, it's a, a balance all of the time in what we're trying to achieve here and make sure that food is affordable. And what we don't want is Red Tractor to be something that those who are wealthy can afford and that everybody else eats the imports that are grown to a completely different standard. George? Uh, Richard, just on your point about those people who have been um, you know, outed on, on YouTube for appalling animal welfare practices, there can be absolutely no excuse for the sorts of things that we have seen on, on, on YouTube. And they are a disgrace to the industry when you see that occurring. So I'm not here to support any of that at all. Uh, 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 but in relation to what Christine has just said and, and, and what your point about whole life assurance, I think it rests on two things. Ensuring that the value for that standard gets passed on supply chain so the producer who's meeting those high standards is properly rewarded for the costs and effort and risk that they are taking to do that. And secondly, ensuring that we are not undermined by bringing in products from all and sundry where we've got no clue about the animal welfare or, 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 or environmental status of, of, of that food that's coming in. Thank you. Difficult times. And I understand that, you know, and we are at a crossroads probably in the British food and farming industry as well. If I can move on to the next question, George, and this is probably something that's directly going to affect your members. I'll try to make the question slightly short and simple, but... Uh, the new agri-environmental schemes and environmental land management might encourage some farmers to become, or some landowners, to become park keepers. Uh, tenant farmers already have quite restricted tenancy agreements compared with their fathers or grandfathers. Um, how are we going to ensure that the tenanted farming sector has a future? And, or are we just going to have a, a retirement uh, plan for present farmers and no opportunity for new farmers to come in. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, how long have we got left on our call? Because it's <laughs> been an hour, probably. Um, but I, I shall try and be try and be brief. But I'll start by saying we need just to understand that we are not moving from a system which has been wholly bad to a system which we are hoping will be wholly good. The basic payment scheme has supported farm businesses in this country who are doing the right thing by animal welfare, by the environment, by landscape, by biodiversity, by water, by clean air. Uh, and yes, it's a blunt instrument, but 
that that policy has supported farmers doing the right thing by those things. We absolutely agree that we need to be looking at how we can move the move the dial to be more specific about the public benefits uh, that we are producing and also dealing with the market failure. Some of the stuff that we've been talking about recently about uh, just now about supply chains. So we should be looking at market failures as well as the, the public goods element. Um, and you're right, uh, Richard, we've got a huge problem in the tenant sector. Half of the tenant sector is now on farm business tenancies. Um, so we're looking at half, half the tenant sector, 15% of the land in this country on farm business tenancies. The average length of term on a farm business tenancy, 3.21 years. 90% of all new tenancies let for five years or less. And we have tenancy agreements with the most restrictive of clauses for tenants. And, the, and connected with that as well, we are concerned that many owners of land will decide to uh, go for tree planting or rewilding or other schemes within, uh, within a landscape recovery or, or, or local nature recovery. And we will see land withdrawn from the tenanted sector of agriculture. And that's a real concern of ours. And it's something we're talking to, to DEFRA uh, about on an almost daily basis. And I was giving evidence to the EFRA Select Committee about that uh, just the other day as well. So we are very concerned, particularly for the FBT farmers. For AHA tenancies with security, there is at least a provision within the Agriculture Act which allows them to object to a landlord's unreasonable refusal to allow them to enter into an agri-environment scheme, which we are working through the regulations with DEFRA with. So we're less concerned about the AHA tenants, but we are very concerned about the future for FPTs. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, panellists, I'll just uh, pass on the rest of that one because I've got two more questions and we are strapped for time and I want to get them in. Uh, that question was put by Dennis Chamberlain, Andy Newbold and Ed Henderson. Uh, the next question, and then I've got the last one after that. Uh, the potato and horticultural sectors have voted to leave the AHDB. Is this the end of the AHDB and what should replace it? Helen, you're a practicing farmer, probably a levy payer as well. Yes, yeah, so well, I've always been actually uh, a fan of uh, the levy paying system. I think it's an amazing opportunity, which we shouldn't abandon, uh, to have a, a, a collective opportunity to raise funds to support uh, the sector. So um, whilst change is always required, and I think that there's lots that the HDB is looking at in terms of how it needs to go forward, I think we, if we didn't have something along these lines, we would want to invent it. Um, there are very few opportunities to bring sensible amounts of money to the table to do the things that are in the interest and the collective in, in, interests of, uh, of the industry. So um, reform, yes, constantly learning and making it more responsive to uh, farmers' needs, looking to the future. Um, but I hope it's not the end of the HDB. Okay, um, Christine or Tamsin, have you got any comments you wish to contribute? If not, well, I just I find it I find it interesting that uh, in the fresh produce side, there's a group of people already forming a better levy group. So that they, you know there is there is a requirement for doing something like this. And I think George would smile if I would say I think this is all about being in touch with your stakeholders and being relevant to your stakeholders. And I think. As true for Red Tractor as it is for AHDB. And if you get a loop from them and you get distant, this sort of thing will happen. George? Yeah, very quickly, Richard. I think the problem that AHDB uh, has had is that it's been too long at the trailing edge and not, not long enough at the leading edge, that it's reformed too slowly, um, that it has uh, um, uh, rested on its laurels to a certain extent, thought it was going to be there forever. And, and we have said to AHDB all down the years that it needs to act more as a membership organization than a government department. And if it was more responsive to its, to its levy payers, then it might be in better shape now. And sadly, and I've said this to Nicholas uh, Safir, I think the strategy that was issued was too little, too late. And I do fear that other sectors will also vote for the same way as potatoes and horticulture. Is it because it's a parafiscal tax that's raised and therefore the dead hand of government sits there thinking it owns the AHDB, despite the fact that it's funded by um, the levy payers. Defra, uh, Tamsin, you've been in DEFRA, you know some of the politics around this. What's your view? I, I don't have a view on it. No, okay. Let me go on, because this is a very important one as our closing question. Mental health is on the increase. Mm -hmm. With the greatest challenges in agriculture since the 1947 Act, 
the rapid loss of basic payment scheme money, the slow introduction of in environmental land management scheme, schemes causing stress, 45 fatal farms accidents last year, of which 38%, 38% were in over 65 year olds, plus more serial, serious injuries than any other industrial sector per person employed. What would the panel's solutions be to this terrible dilemma we're facing? George. Uh, Richard, um, as you know, I used to be a trustee of the Farming Community Network and I chaired the Farming Community Network for, uh, for, for five years and I was proud to see how that developed in bringing these issues to the fore and we certainly need to be talking more uh, about these issues. We have a three three part mantra in terms of what we provide to members and that's advice when they uh, when they need it, information when they want it and supporting them all the time. And quite a lot of that support is about pastoral care. So when we pick up the phone from a member who's got a question, they may have a raft of other issues they want to talk about um, in terms of their family or what's going on on the farm or just want to talk about issues that they're, they're concerned about. And actually what we find, Richard, is it's often the women within the farm families that hold the key to understanding what's going on. They know and are concerned about what is happening with their men folk. And I think the more that we engage with the women within farm families, the more we will get to, to, to the root of this issue. But it's, it's really important that we provide those opportunities for people just to share their hearts. I had one member, I'll, I'll finish with a story, one member who rung me many years ago who said, George, I just want to say three things to you. And I don't want you to say anything at all. And I said, OK. He said, firstly, my wife's just been diagnosed with breast cancer. Secondly, my daughter's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And thirdly, my cattle have just gone down with TB. And then he put the phone down. Now, what do I do with that call? What do I do? I, clearly, he didn't want me to talk to him right then. But I called him back in an hour. We had a tearful conversation. And, and, and he felt at, at least better about the day for having that conversation with me. That we just need to take every opportunity. Thanks, George. I'm conscious of time. Uh, this question was from Stephen Watkins, and I think it is really poignant for the moment that we address this. So, Tamsin. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sobering figures. And I remember the Oxford Farming Conference before COVID, there was a whole session on well-being and these issues. And as George was saying, conversations about being open and having these conversations are important. But structurally, I think it's about having certainty about the future. And certainly the farmers, and people we've spoken to, of course, over the last 12 to 18 months, they want clarity about the future of the industry. They want clarity about what the length of the transition and they want clarity about the sort of system of support that facilitates that transition. I think that some of those things would help in addition to the ability to and the opportunity to talk about things and perform it's probably not a place for red tractor it's more the um health, the, health, the and, safety health, is. Charity health and safety and also the um health and safety executive yeah. but is yeah. there anything we can do that from your experience in this sector uh, well uh, I, I, we are we are actually going to be include including some areas on health and safety in our in our new standards and there was some pushback on those and we got the full support of the nfu to say no this is far too important for our industry we need to start including some way of trying to monitor health and safety in this area so you're saying well done nfu for taking up that slightly unpopular initiative yes so they're, they're supporting us in that so we, we we can make some difference yeah okay helen I think there's a, a root problem that farmers are isolated. Uh, a lot of farmers are working solo these days or with very few farm staff around them. Um, we're proud people. I think there's a terror of failure. You know, to lose the family farm um, uh, is probably the worst sin you can commit. And so I think the pressures on farming and far are immense. Uh, you are working in a dangerous environment and it is a lot of farms are really underinvested. Um, because they can't afford to invest, actually. Uh, I mean, I think this all, a lot of this does come back, well, to two things. One, that isolation, the way that farms are specialised and are, are, are on their own. And secondly, that there is such strong financial pressure that farmers aren't able to put in place some of the time the things that they need to, uh, to, to make sure that they're safe. 
I think some of the opportunities come actually through um, uh, how do we get farmers together more? Uh, you know, we always have this sort of markets and less farmers go to market now than they used to, but that was a great social hub for farmers. I'm, I'm quite interested by how some of these land scale initiatives may work um, as we start to look at how we get farmers to collaborate in a place um, for environmental reasons, but how we could also build on that collaboration to help share, mentor, uh, think about collaborating in, in other dimensions too. That's not the sole answer. One's still going to have to address some of those core issues. But Thank I think- you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try and bring it to an end. I'll just repeat for the benefit of us as panelists, but also though to the audience as well, 38% of deaths and serious injuries on farms are by from over 65 year olds. Something is wrong. Would I allow a 70 year old roofer to come and repair the tiles on my roof or anything like that? You know, something, something is going on. And I don't wish to push old people off of farms, but you know, there is a hang on their existent lifestyle option and that sort of thing. And 65 year old pluses are, in a vulnerable position doing a dangerous job and there's a mindset has got to change. I'll leave you with a slightly lighter one, but I'm not going to ask, ask for answers to this question. But this was the last one on my list and it might make you smile at least. This is from uh, past master David Bolton. Should prime minister's spouses have any influence on government policy? But we won't ask, uh, answer that question. We will just hand back to Jeremy Finnis, our um, gentlemen introducer and now closer and I will say very briefly panelists thank you very much indeed for your contributions thank you Richard I'm assuming I'm on screen I can't see whether I am or not thank you uh, well thank you very much uh, panel and I'm thanking you on behalf of everybody who's tuned in tonight uh, getting on for 200 people I think and thanks for sharing your knowledge, experience, and indeed your wisdom with us. Uh, there can seldom have been a, a time when we need it more. I made a couple of notes during the, the uh, proceedings. Um, Mr. Dunn's story about that dreadful phone call, I think it brings us all very, very uh, down to earth. That's what people are facing when 80% of the profit made in farming comes from the BPS and that's being withdrawn, we are going to get more of those phone calls. Uh, Nigel Barnes had a, a slightly tongue-in-cheek comment on the chat line saying the audits are the most stressful time of the year for him. So uh, bear that in mind, Christine, please. Um, I, you know, I've been in the industry more than 40 years and it's certainly there's the most uncertainty that I've ever seen. And uh, remember the word sustainability, which we haven't heard much of tonight, but sustainability in farming is also about making enough money to sustain a business. And we need to be able to do that. Um, thank you to uh, Graham and uh, Duncan, our clerk and assistant clerk for all they've done to uh, lay on this uh, evening's proceedings, uh, which have gone relatively smoothly. And, um, and indeed all they do for the livery. Um, if you uh, in the audience feel moved to give some support to our charitable aims, please do head over to Virgin Money Giving and donate to what we call our virtual farm cart. There's a real farm cart that goes around at our dinners, uh, which collects uh, hard cash and sometimes foreign currency, which is not, uh, not to be encouraged. But please do go over to Virgin Money if you'd like to uh, give us some help. To the living room and watching, um, we hope to meet up in person uh, at last, uh, at our annual banquet on the 29th of June, which is at the Haberdashers Hall. And Graham Bamford tells me there are tickets still available. Please look at that. So thanks everybody for your very kind attention. We hope to do this again in the future sometime. And uh, good night to all of you and safe home. <laughs>